Welcome to another Read With Me session. Today we're continuing The Kite Runner. I'm going to read Chapter 10. March 1981. A young woman sat across from us. She was dressed in an olive green dress with a black shawl wrapped tightly around her face against the night chill. She burst into prayer every time the truck jerked or stumbled into a pothole, her bismillah peaking with each of the truck's shudders and jolts. Her husband, a burly man in baggy pants and a sky-blue turban, cradled an infant in one arm and thumped prayer beads with his free hand. His lips moved in silent prayer. There were others, in all about a dozen, including Baba and me, sitting with our suitcases between our legs, cramped with these strangers in the trampoline-covered cab of an old Russian truck. My innards had been roiling since we'd left Kabul just after two in the morning. Baba never said so, but I knew he saw my car sickness as yet another of my array of weakness. I saw it on his embarrassed face the couple of times my stomach had clenched so badly I had moaned. When the burly guy with the beads, the praying woman's husband, asked if I was going to get sick, I said I might. Baba looked away. The man lifted his corner of the trampoline cover and rapped on the driver's window, asked him to stop. But the driver, Karim, a scrawny, dark-skinned man with hawk-boned features and a pencil-thin mustache, shook his head. We're too close to Kabul, he shot back. Tell him to have a strong stomach. Baba grumbled something under his breath. I wanted to tell him I was sorry, but suddenly I was salivating, the back of my throat tasting bile. I turned around, lifted the trampoline, and threw up over the side of the moving truck. Behind me, Baba was apologizing to other passengers, as if car sickness was a crime, as if you weren't supposed to get sick when you were 18. I threw up two more times before Karim agreed to stop, mostly so I wouldn't stink up his vehicle, the instrument of his livelihood. Karim was a people smuggler. It was a pretty lucrative business then, driving people out of Shoravi occupied Kabul to the relative safety of Pakistan. He was taking us to Jalalabad, about 170 kilometers southeast of Kabul, where his brother Tour, who had a bigger truck with a second convoy of refugees, was waiting to drive us across the Khaybar Pass and into Peshawar. We were a few kilometers west of Mahipar Falls when Karim pulled to the side of the road. Mahipar, which means flying fish, was a high summit with a precipitous drop overlooking the hydro plant the Germans had built for Afghanistan back in 1967. Baba and I had driven over the summit countless times on our way to Jalalabad, the city of cypress trees and sugarcane fields where Afghans vacationed in the winter. I hopped down the back of the truck and lurched to the dusty embankment on the side of the road. My mouth filled with saliva, a sign of the retching that was yet to come. I stumbled to the edge of the cliff overlooking the deep valley that was shrouded in darkness. I stood up, hands on my kneecaps, and waited for the bile. Somewhere, a branch snapped, an owl hooted. The wind, soft and cold, clicked through tree branches and stirred the bushes that sprinkled the slope, and from below, the faint sound of water tumbling through the valley. Standing on the shoulder of the road, I thought of the way we'd left the house where I'd lived my entire life, as if we were going out for a bite. Dishes smeared with kufta piled in the kitchen sink, laundry in the wicker basket in the foyer, beds unmade, Baba's business suits hanging in the closet, tapestries still hung on the walls of the living room, and my mother's books still crowded the shelves in Baba's study. The signs of our elopement were subtle. My parents' wedding picture was gone, as was the grainy photograph of my grandfather and King Nader Shah standing over the dead deer. A few items of clothing were missing from the closets. The leather-bound notebook Rahim Khan had given me five years earlier was gone. In the morning, Jalaluddin, our seventh servant in five years, would probably think we'd gone out for a stroll or a drive. We hadn't told him. You wouldn't trust anyone in Kabul anymore. For a fee or under threat, people told on each other, neighbor on neighbor, child on parent, brother on brother, servant on master, friend on friend. I thought of the singer Ahmad Zahir, who had played the accordion on my 13th birthday. He had gone for a drive with some friends and someone had later found his body on the side of the road, a bullet in the back of his head. The Rafiqs, the comrades, were everywhere and they'd split Kabul into two groups, those who eavesdropped and those who didn't. 
The tricky part was that no one knew who belonged to which. A casual remark to the tailor while getting fitted for a suit might land you in the dungeons of Polecharchi. Complain about the curfew to the butcher, and next thing you know, you were behind bars staring at the muzzle end of a Kalashnikov. Even at the dinner table, in the privacy of their home, people had to speak in calculated manner. The Rafiqs were in the classrooms too. They taught children to spy on their parents, what to listen for, whom to tell. What was I doing in this road in the middle of the night? I should have been in bed under my blanket, a book with dog-eared pages at my side. This had to be a dream. Had to be. Tomorrow morning, I'd wake up, peek out the window. No grim-faced Russian soldiers patrolling the sidewalks. No tanks rolling up and down the streets of my city. Their turrets swiveling like accusing fingers. No rubble, no curfews, no Russian army personnel carriers weaving through the bazaars. Then behind me, I heard Baba and Karim discussing the arrangement in Jalalabad over a smoke. Karim was reassuring Baba that his brother had a big truck of excellent and first-class quality, and that the trek to Peshawar would be very routine. He could take you there with his eyes closed, Karim said. I overheard him telling Baba how he and his brother knew the Russian and Afghan soldiers who worked the checkpoints, how they had set up a mutually profitable arrangement. This was no dream. As if on cue, a MiG suddenly screamed past overhead. Karim tossed his cigarette and produced a handgun from his waist. Pointing it to the sky and making shooting gestures, he spat and cursed at the MiG. I wondered where Hassan was, then the inevitable. I vomited on a tangle of weeds. My retching and groaning drowned in the deafening roar of the MiG. We pulled up to the checkpoint in Mahipar 20 minutes later. Our driver let the truck idle and hopped down to greet the approaching voices. Feet crushed gravel. Words were exchanged, brief and hushed. A flick of a lighter. Spasaba. Another flick of the lighter. Someone laughed, a shrill cackling sound that made me jump. Baba's hand clamped down on my thigh. The laughing man broke into song, a slurring off-key rendition of an old Afghan wedding song delivered with a thick Russian accent. Oh, his taboro, mohemano, his taboro, go slowly, my lovely moon, go slowly. Boot heels clicked on asphalt. Someone flung open the tarpaulin hanging over the back of the truck and three faces peered in. One was Karim, the other two were soldiers. One Afghan, the other a grinning Russian, face like a bulldog's, cigarette dangling from the side of his mouth. Behind them, a bone-colored moon hung in the sky. Karim and the Afghan soldier had a brief exchange in Pashto. I caught a little of it, something about Tur and his bad luck. The Russian soldier thrust his face into the rear of the truck. He was humming the wedding song and drumming his finger on the edge of the tailgate. Even in the dim light of the moon, I saw the glazed look in his eyes as they skipped from passenger to passenger. Despite the cold, sweat streamed down his brow. His eyes settled on the young woman wearing the black shawl. He spoke in Russian to Karim without taking his eye off her. Karim gave a curt reply in Russian, which the soldier returned with an even curter retort. The Afghan soldier said something too, in a low, reasoning voice. But the Russian soldier shouted something that made the other two flinch. I could feel Baba tightening up next to me. Karim cleared his throat, dropped his head, said the soldier wanted a half hour with a lady in the back of the truck. The young woman pulled the shawl down over her face, burst into tears. The toddler sitting in her husband's lap started crying too. The husband's face had become as pale as the moon hovering above. He told Karim to ask Mr. Soldier Sahib to show a little mercy. Maybe he had a sister or mother, maybe he had a wife too. The Russian listened to Karim and barked a series of words. It's his price for letting us pass, Karim said. He couldn't bring himself to look the husband in the eye. But we've paid a fair price already. He's getting paid good money, the husband said. Karim and the Russian soldier spoke. He says, he says every price has a tax. That was when Baba stood up. It was my turn to clamp a hand on his thigh, but Baba pried it loose, snatched his leg away. When he stood, he eclipsed the moonlight. I want you to ask this man something, Baba said. He said it to Karim, but looked directly at the Russian officer. Ask him where his shame is. They spoke. 
He says this is war. There is no shame in war. Tell him is wrong. War doesn't negate decency. It demands it, even more than in times of peace. Do you have to always be a hero? I thought, my heart fluttering. Can't you just let it go for once? But I knew he couldn't. It wasn't in his nature. The problem was his nature was going to get us all killed. The Russian soldier said something to Karim, a smile creasing his lips. Agha sahib, Karim said, these Rusi are not like us. They understand nothing about respect, honor. What did he say? He says he'll enjoy putting a bullet in you almost as much as... Karim trailed off, but nodded his head toward the young woman who had caught the guard's eye. The soldier flicked his unfinished cigarette and unholstered his handgun. So this is where Baba dies, I thought. This is how it's going to happen. In my head, I said a prayer I had learned in a school. Tell him I'll take a thousand of his bullets before I let this indecency take place, Baba said. My mind flashed to that winter day six years ago. Me peering around the corner in the alley. Kamal and Wali holding Hassan down. Asif's buttocks muscles clenching and unclenching. His hips thrusting back and forth. Some hero I had been, fretting about the kite. Sometimes I too wonder if I was really Baba's son. The bulldog-faced Russian raised his gun. Baba, sit down, please, I said, tugging at his sleeve. I think he really means to shoot you. Baba slapped my hand away. Haven't I thought you anything? He snapped. He turned to the grinning soldier. Tell him he'd better kill me good with that first shot, because if I don't go down, I'm tearing him to pieces. God damn his father. The Russian soldier's grin never faltered when he heard the translation. He clicked the safety on the gun, pointed the barrel to Baba's chest, heart pounding in my throat. I buried my face in my hands. The gun roared. It's done then. I'm 18 and alone. I have no one left in the world. Baba's dead and now I have to bury him. Where do I bury him? Where do I go after that? But the whirlwind of half-thoughts spinning in my head came to a halt when I cracked my eyelids, found Baba still standing. I saw a second Russian officer with the others. It was from the muzzle of his upturned gun that smoke swirled. The soldier who had meant to shoot Baba had already holstered his weapon. He was shuffling his feet. I had never felt more like crying and laughing at the same time. The second Russian officer, gray-haired and heavy-set, spoke to us in broken Farsi. He apologized for his comrade's behavior. Russia sends them here to fight, he said. But they are just boys. And when they come here, they find the pleasure of drug. He gave the younger officer the ruffled look of a father exasperated with his misbehaving son. This one is attached to drug now. I tried to stop him. He waved us off. Moments later, we were pulling away. I heard a laugh and then the first soldier's voice slurry and off-key singing the old wedding song. We rode in silence for about 15 minutes before the young woman's husband suddenly stood and did something I'd seen many others do before him. He kissed Baba's hand. Tour's bad luck. Hadn't I overheard that in a snippet of conversation back at Mahipar? We rolled into Jalalabad about an hour before sunrise. Karim ushered us quickly from the truck into a one-story house at the intersection of two dirt roads lined with flat one-story homes, acacia trees, and closed shops. I pulled the collar of my coat against the chill as we hurried into the house, dragging our belongings. For some reason, I remember smelling radishes. Once he had us inside the dimly lit bare living room, Karim locked the front door, pulled the tattered sheets that passed for curtains. Then he took a deep breath and gave us the bad news. His brother Tour couldn't take us to Peshawar. It seemed his truck's engine had blown the week before and Tour was still waiting for parts. Last week? Someone exclaimed. If you knew this, why did you bring us here? I caught a flurry of movement out of the corner of my eye, then a blur of something zipping across the room. And the next thing I saw was Karim slammed against the wall, his sandaled feet dangling two feet above the floor, wrapped around his neck were Baba's hands. I'll tell you why, Baba snapped, because he got paid for his leg of the trip. That's all he cared about. Karim was making guttural choking sounds. The spittle dripped from the corner of his mouth. Put him down, Agha, you're killing him, one of the passengers said. It's what I intend to do, Baba said. 
What none of the others in the room knew was that Baba wasn't joking. Karim was turning red and kicking his legs. Baba kept choking him until the young mother, the one the Russian officer had fancied, begged him to stop. Karim collapsed on the floor, rolled around fighting for air when Baba finally let go. The room fell silent. Less than two hours ago, Baba had volunteered to take a bullet for the honor of a woman he didn't even know. Now he'd almost choked the man to death. Would have done it cheerfully if not for the pleas of that same woman. Something thumped next door. No, not next door, below. What's that? Someone asked. The others, Karim panted between labored breaths. In the basement. How long have they been waiting? Baba said, standing over Karim. Two weeks. I thought you said the truck broke down last week. Karim rubbed his throat. It might have been the week before, he croaked. How long? What? How long for the parts? Baba roared. Karim flinched, but said nothing. I was glad for the darkness. I didn't want to see the murderous look on Baba's face. The stench of something dank like mildew bulged my nostrils the moment Karim opened the door that led down the creaky steps to the basement. We descended in single file. The steps groaned under Baba's weight. Standing in the cold basement, I felt watched by eyes blinking in the dark. I saw shapes huddled around the room, their silhouettes thrown on the walls by the dim light of a pair of kerosene lamps. A low murmur buzzed through the basement. Beneath it, the sound of water drops trickling somewhere and something else, a scratching sound. Baba sighed behind me and dropped the bags. Karim told us it should be a matter of a couple of short days before the truck was fixed. Then we'd be on our way to Peshawar, on to freedom, on to safety. The basement was our home for the next week, and by the third night, I discovered the source of the scratching sounds. Rats. Once my eyes adjusted to the dark, I counted about 30 refugees in that basement. We sat shoulder to shoulder along the walls, ate crackers, bread with dates, apples. That first night, all the men prayed together. One of the refugees asked Baba why he wasn't joining them. God is going to save us all. Why don't you pray to him? Baba snorted a pinch of his snuff, stretched his legs. What'll save us is eight cylinders and a good carburetor. That silenced the rest of them for good about the matter of God. It was later that first night when I discovered that two of the people hiding with us were Kamal and his father. That was shocking though, seeing Kamal sitting in the basement just a few feet away from me. But when he and his father came over to our side of the room and I saw Kamal's face, really saw it, he had withered. There was simply no other word for it. His eyes gave me a hollow look and no recognition at all registered in them. His shoulders hunched and his cheeks sagged like they were too tired to cling to the bone beneath. His father, who'd owned a movie theater in Kabul, was telling Baba how three months before, a stray bullet had struck his wife in the temple and killed her. Then he told Baba about Kamal. I caught only snippets of it. Should have never let him go alone. Always so handsome, you know. Four of them. Tried to fight. God. Took him. Bleeding down there. His pants. Doesn't talk anymore. Just stares. There would be no trucks. Karim told us after we'd spent a week in the rat-infested basement. The truck was beyond repair. There is another option, Karim said, his voice raising amid the groans. His cousin owned a fuel truck and had smuggled people with it a couple of times. He was there in Jalalabad and could probably fit us all. Everyone except an elderly couple decided to go. We left that night, Baba and I, Kamal and his father, the others. Karim and his cousin, a square-faced, balding man named Aziz, helped us get into the fuel tank. One by one, we mounted the idling truck's rear deck, climbed the rear access ladder, and slid down into the tank. I remember Baba climbed halfway up the ladder, hopped back down, and fished a snuff box from his pocket. He emptied the box and picked up a handful of dirt from the middle of the unpaved road. He kissed the dirt poured into the box, stowed the box in his breast pocket next to his heart. It's devastating. Panic. You open your mouth. Open it so wide your jaws creak. You order your lungs to draw air now. You need air. Need it now. But your airways ignore you. They collapse. 
tighten, squeeze, and suddenly you're breathing through a drinking straw. Your mouth closes and your lips purse, and all you can manage is a strangled croak. Your hands wriggle and shake. Somewhere a dam has cracked open and a flood of cold sweat spills drenches your body. You want to scream. You would if you could, but you have to breathe to scream. Panic. The basement had been dark. The fuel tank was pitch black. I looked right, left, up, down, waved my hands before my eyes, didn't see so much as a hint of movement. I blinked, blinked again, nothing at all. The air wasn't right. It was too thick, almost solid. Air wasn't supposed to be solid. I wanted to reach out with my hands, crush the air into pieces, stuff them down my windpipe. And the stench of gasoline, my eyes stung from the fumes like someone had peeled my lids back and rubbed a lemon on them. My nose caught fire with each breath. You could die in a place like this, I thought. A scream was coming, coming, coming. And then a small miracle. Baba tugged at my sleeve and something glowed green in the dark. Light! Baba's wristwatch. I kept my eyes glued to those fluorescent green hands. I was so afraid I'd lose them, I didn't dare blink. Slowly, I became aware of my surroundings. I heard groans and muttered prayers. I heard a baby cry, its mother's muted soothing. Someone wretched, someone else cursed the shore avi. The truck bounced side to side, up and down, heads banged against metal. Think of something good, Baba said in my ear. Something happy. Something good? Something happy? I let my mind wander. I let it come. Friday afternoon in Pagman, an open field of grass speckled with mulberry trees in blossom. Hassan and I stand ankle deep in untamed grass. I'm tugging on the line. The spool is spinning in Hassan's calloused hands. Our eyes turned up to the kite in the sky. Not a word passes between us, not because we have nothing to say, but because we don't have to say anything. That's how it is between people who are each other's first memories, people who have fed from the same breast. A breeze stirs the grass and Hassan lets the spool roll. The kite spins, dips, steadies. Our twin shadows dance on the rippling grass. From somewhere over the low brick wall at the other end of the field, we hear chatter and laughter and the chirping of a water fountain and music, something old and familiar. I think it's Yamola on rhubarb strings. Someone calls our names over the wall, says it's time for tea and cake. I didn't remember what month that was or what year even. I only knew the memory lived in me, a perfectly encapsulated morsel of a good past. A brush stroke of color on the gray, barren canvas that our lives had become. The rest of that ride is scattered bits and pieces of memory that come and go. Most of it sounds and smells. Mix roaring past overhead. Staccatos of gunfire. A donkey braying nearby. The jingling of bells and mewling of sheep. Gravel crushed under the truck's tires. A baby wailing in the dark. The stench of gasoline, vomit, and shit. What I remember next is the blinding light of early morning as I climbed out of the fuel tank. I remember turning my face up to the sky, squinting, breathing like the world was running out of air. I lay on the side of the dirt road next to a rocky trench, looked up to the gray morning sky, thankful for air, thankful for light, thankful to be alive. We're in Pakistan, Amir, Baba said. He was standing over me. Karim says he will call for a bus to take us to Peshawar. I rolled onto my chest, still lying on the cool dirt, and saw our suitcases on either side of Baba's feet. Through the upside-down V between his legs, I saw the truck idling on the side of the road, the other refugees climbing down the rear ladder. Beyond that, the dirt road unrolled through fields that were like leaden sheets, under the gray sky and disappeared behind the line of bowl-shaped hills. Along the way, it passed a small village, strung out atop a sun-baked slope. My eyes returned to our suitcases. They made me sad for Baba. After everything he'd built, planned, fought for, fretted over, dreamed of, this was the summation of his life. One disappointing son and two suitcases. Someone was screaming. No, not screaming, wailing. 
I saw the passengers huddled in a circle, heard their urgent voices. Someone said the word fumes. Someone else said it too. The wail turned into a throat-ripping screech. Baba and I hurried to the back of onlookers and pushed our way through them. Kamal's father was sitting cross-legged in the center of the circle, rocking back and forth, kissing his son's ashen face. He won't breathe. My boy won't breathe, he was crying. Kamal's lifeless body lay on his father's lap. His right hand, uncurled and limp, bounced to the rhythm of his father's sobs. My boy, he won't breathe. Allah help him breathe. Baba knelt beside him and curled an arm around his shoulder. But Kamal's father shoved him away and longed for Karim who was standing nearby with his cousin. What happened next was too fast and too short to be called a scuffle. Karim uttered a surprised cry and backpedaled. I saw an arm swing, a leg kick. A moment later, Kamal's father was standing with Karim's gun in his hand. Don't shoot me, Karim cried. But before any of us could say or do a thing, Kamal's father shoved the barrel in his own mouth. I'll never forget the echo of that blast or the flash of light and the spray of red. I doubled over again and dry heaved in the side of the road. I know this is fiction, but I'm sure even worse things have happened in Afghanistan or any country that has gone through war. Let's read the next chapter. Chapter 11, Vermont, California, 1980s. Baba loved the idea of America. It was living in America that gave him an ulcer. I remember the two of us walking through Lake Elizabeth Park in Vermont, a few streets down from our apartment, and watching boys at batting practice, little girls giggling on the swings in the playground. Baba would enlighten me with his politics during those walks with long-winded dissertations. There are only three real men in the world, Amir, he'd say. He'd count them off on his fingers. America, the brash savior, Britain and Israel. The rest of them, he used to wave his hand and make a pet sound. They're gossiping old women. The bit about Israel used to draw the ire of Afghans in Vermont who accused him of being pro-Jewish and de facto anti-Islam. Baba would meet them for tea and root cake at the park, drive them crazy with his politics. What they don't understand, he'd tell me later, is that religion has nothing to do with it. In Baba's view, Israel was an island of real men in a sea of Arabs too busy getting fat off their oil to care for their own. Israel does this, Israel does that, Baba would say in a mock Arabic accent. Then do something about it. Take action. You're Arabs. Help the Palestinians then. He loathed Jimmy Carter, whom he called a big-toothed keratin. In 1980, when we were still in Kabul, the U.S. announced it would be boycotting the Olympic Games in Moscow. Bah, bah, Baba exclaimed with disgust. Brezhnev is massacring Afghans and all that peanut eater can say is I will come swim in your pool. Baba believed Carter had unwittingly done more for communism than Leonid Brezhnev. He's not fit to run this country. It's like putting a boy who can't ride a bike behind the wheel of a brand new Cadillac. What America and the world needed was a hard man, a man to be reckoned with, someone who took actions instead of wringing his hands. That someone came in the form of Ronald Reagan. And when Reagan went on TV and called the Shoravi the evil empire, Baba went out and bought a picture of the grinning president giving a thumbs up. He framed the picture and hung it in our hallway, nailing it right next to the old black and white of himself in his necktie, shaking hands with King Zahir Shah. Most of our neighbors in Vermont were bus drivers, policemen, gas station attendants, and unwed mothers collecting welfare. Exactly the sort of blue-collar people who would soon suffocate under the pillow Reaganomic press to their faces. Baba was the lone Republican in our building. But the Bay Area's smog stung his eyes, the traffic noise gave him headaches, and the pollen made him cough. The fruit was never sweet enough, the water never clean enough, and where were all the trees and open fields? For two years, I tried to get Baba to enroll in ESL classes to improve his broken English. But he scoffed at the idea. Maybe I'll spell cat and the teacher will give me a glitter star so I can run home and show it off to you, he'd grumble. 
One Sunday in the spring of 1983, I walked into a bookstore that sold used paperbacks next to the Indian movie theater just west of where Amtrak crossed Vermont Boulevard. I told Baba I'd be out in five minutes and he shrugged. He had been working at a gas station in Vermont and had the day off. I watched him jaywalk across Vermont Boulevard and enter Fast and Easy, a little grocery store run by an elderly Vietnamese couple, Mr. and Mrs. Nguyen, I guess. They were gray-haired, friendly people. She had Parkinson's. He'd had his hip replaced. He's like six million dollar man now, she always said to me, laughing toothlessly. Remember six million dollar man, Amir? Then Mr. Nguyen would scowl like Lee Majors, pretend he was running in a slow motion. I was flipping through a worn copy of Mike Hammer Mystery when I heard the screaming and glass breaking. I dropped the book and hurried across the street. I found Nguyen's behind the counter, all the way against the wall, faces ashen, Mr. Nguyen's arms wrapped around his wife. On the floor, oranges, an overturned magazine rack, a broken jar of beef jerky, and shards of glass at Baba's feet. It turned out that Baba had had no cash on him for the oranges. He'd written Mr. Noyen a check, and Mr. Noyen had asked for an ID. He wants to see my license, Baba bellowed in Farsi. Almost two years we've bought this damn fruits and put money in his pocket, and the son of a dog wants to see my license. Baba, it's not personal, I said, smiling at the Noyens. They're supposed to ask for an ID. I don't want you here, Mr. Nguyen said, stepping in front of his wife. He was pointing at Baba with his cane. He turned to me. You're a nice young man, but your father? He's crazy. Not welcome anymore. Does he think I'm a thief? Baba said, his voice rising. People had gathered outside. They were staring. What kind of country is this? No one trusts anybody. I call police, Mrs. Nguyen said, poking out her face. You get out or I'll call police. Please, Mrs. Noyan, don't call the police. I'll take him home. Just don't call the police, okay? Please? Yes, you take him home. Good idea, Mr. Noyan said. His eyes, behind his wire-rimmed bifocals, never left Baba. I let Baba through the doors. He kicked the magazine on his way out. After I'd made him promise he wouldn't go back in, I returned to the store and apologized to the Noyans told them my father was going through a difficult time. I gave Mrs. Noyan our telephone number and address and told her to get an estimate for the damages. Please call me as soon as you know. I'll pay for everything, Mrs. Noyan. I'm so sorry. Mrs. Noyan took the sheet of paper from me and nodded. I saw her hands were shaking more than usual and that made me angry at Baba. He's causing an old woman to shake like that. My father's still adjusting to life in America. I said by way of explanation. I wanted to tell them that in Kabul, we snapped a tree branch and used it as credit card. Hassan and I would take the wooden stick to the bread maker. He'd carve notches on our stick with his knife. One notch for each loaf of naan he'd pull for us from the tandoor's roaring flames. At the end of the month, my father paid him for the number of notches on the stick. That was it. No questions. No ID. But I didn't tell them. I thanked Mr. Noyan for not calling the cops. Took Baba home. He sulked and smoked on the balcony while I made rice with chicken neck stew. A year and a half since we'd step off the Boeing from Peshawar and Baba was still adjusting. We ate in silence that night. After two bites, Baba pushed away his plate. I glanced at him across the table. His nails chipped and black with engine oil. His knuckles scraped, the smell of the gas station, dust, sweat, and gasoline on his clothes. Baba was like the widower who remarries but can't let go of his dead wife. He missed the sugarcane fields of Jalalabad and the gardens of Pagman. He missed people milling in and out of his house, missed walking down the bustling aisles of Shore Bazaar and greeting people who knew him and his father, knew his grandfather, people who shared ancestors with him whose pasts intertwined with his. For me, America was a place to bury my memories. For Baba, a place to mourn his. Maybe we should go back to Peshawar, I said, watching the ice float in my glass of water. We'd spent six months in Peshawar, waiting for the INS to issue our visas. Our grimy one-bedroom apartment smelled like dirty socks and cat droppings, but we were surrounded by people we knew. At least people Baba knew. 
He'd invite the entire corridor of neighbors for dinner, most of them Afghans waiting for visas. Inevitably, someone would bring a set of tabla and someone else a harmonium. Tea would brew, and whoever had a passing singing voice would sing until the sun rose, the mosquitoes stopped buzzing, and clapping hands grew sore. You were happier there, Baba. It was more like home, I said. Peshawar was good for me, not good for you. You work so hard here. It's not so bad now, he said, meaning since he had become the day manager at the gas station. But I'd seen the way he winced and rubbed his wrists on damp days, the way sweat erupted on his forehead as he reached for his bottle of antiacids after meals. Besides, I didn't bring us here for me, did I? I reached across the table and put my hand on his, my student hand, clean and soft, on his laborer's hand, grubby and calloused. I thought of all the trucks, train sets, and bikes he'd bought me in Kabul. Now, America. One last gift for Amir. Just one month after we arrived in the U.S., Baba found a job off Washington Boulevard as an assistant at a gas station owned by an Afghan acquaintance. He just started looking for work the same week we arrived. Six days a week, Baba pulled 12-hour shifts pumping gas, running the register, changing oil, and washing windshields. I'd bring him lunch sometimes and find him looking for a pack of cigarettes on the shelves, a customer waiting on the other side of the oil-stained counter. Baba's face drawn and pale under the bright fluorescent lights. The electronic bell over the door would ding-dong when I walked in, and Baba would look over his shoulder, wave and smile, his eyes watering from fatigue. The same day he was hired, Baba and I went to our eligibility officer in San Jose, Mrs. Dobbins. She was an overweight black woman with twinkling eyes and a dimpled smile. She told me once that she sang in church and I believed her. She had a voice that made me think of warm milk and honey. Baba dropped a stack of food stamps on her desk. Thank you, but I don't want, Baba said. I work always. In Afghanistan, I work. In America, I work. Thank you very much, Mrs. Dobbins, but I don't like it free money. Mrs. Dobbins blinked picked up the food stamps, looked from me to Baba like we were pulling a prank or slipping her a trick, as Hassan used to say. Fifteen years I'd been doing this job and nobody's ever done this, she said. And that was how Baba ended those humiliating food stamp moments at the cash register and alleviated one of his greatest fears, that an Afghan would see him buying food with charity money. Baba walked out of the welfare office like a man cured from a tumor. That summer of 1983, I graduated from high school at the age of 20, by far the oldest senior tossing his martyr board on the football field that day. I remember losing Baba in the swarm of families, flashing cameras and blue gowns. I found him near the 20-yard line, hands shoved in his pockets, camera dangling on his chest. He disappeared and reappeared behind the people moving between us, squealing blue-clad girls, hugging, crying, Boys high-fiving their fathers, each other. Baba's beard was graying, his hair thinning at the temples. And hadn't he been taller in Kabul? He was wearing his brown suit, his only suit, the same one he wore to Afghan weddings and funerals, and the red tie I had bought for his 50th birthday that year. Then he saw me and waved, smiled. He motioned for me to wear my martyr board and took a picture of me with the school's clock tower in the background. I smiled for him. In a way, this was his day more than mine. He walked to me, curled his arm around my neck, and gave my brow a single kiss. I am Muftakhar Amir, he said, proud. His eyes gleamed when he said that, and I liked being on the receiving end of that look. He took me to an Afghan kebab house in Hayward that night and ordered far too much food. He told the owner that his son was going to college in the fall. I had debated him briefly about that just before graduation and told him I wanted to get a job, help out, save some money, maybe go to college the following year. But he had shot me one of his smoldering Baba looks and the words had vaporized on my tongue. After dinner, Baba took me to a bar across the street from the restaurant. The place was dim and the acrid smell of beer I'd always disliked permeated the walls. Men in baseball caps and tank tops played pool, clouds of cigarette smoke hovering over the green tables, swirling in the fluorescent light. We drew looks, Baba in his brown suit and me in pleated slacks and sports jacket. 
We took a seat at the bar, next to an old man, his leathery face sickly in the blue glue of the Michelob sign overhead. Baba lit a cigarette and ordered us beer. Tonight, I am too much happy, he announced to no one and everyone. Tonight, I drinking with my son. And one please for my friend, he said, patting the old man on the back. The old fellow tipped his hat and smiled. He had no upper teeth. Baba finished his beer in three gulps and ordered another. He had three before I forced myself to drink a quarter of mine. By then, he had bought the old man a scotch and treated a foursome of pool players to a pitcher of Budweiser, I think. Men shook his hand and clapped him on the back. They drank to him. Someone lit his cigarette. Baba loosened his tie and gave the old man a handful of quarters. He pointed to the jukebox. Tell him to play his favorite songs, he said to me. The old man nodded and gave Baba a salute. Soon, country music was blaring, and just like that, Baba had started a party. At one point, Baba stood, raised his beer, spilling it on the sawdust floor, and yelled, Fuck the Russia! The bar's laughter, then its full-throated echo followed. Baba bought another round of pitcher for everyone. When we left, everyone was sad to see him go. Kabul, Peshawar, Hayward. Same old Baba, I thought, smiling. I drove us home in Baba's old ochre yellow Buick century. Baba dozed off in the way, snoring like a jackhammer. I smelled tobacco on him and alcohol, sweet and pungent. But he sat up when I stopped the car and said in a hoarse voice, Keep driving to the end of the block. Why, Baba? Just go. He had me park at the south end of the street. He reached in his coat pocket and handed me a set of keys. There, he said, pointing to the car in front of us. It was an old model Ford, a dark color I couldn't discern in the moonlight. It needs painting and I'll have one of the guys at the station pull in new shocks. But it runs. I took the keys, stunned. I looked from him to the car. You'll need it to go to college, he said. I took his hand in mine, squeezed it. My eyes were tearing over, and I was glad for the shadows that hid our faces. Thank you, Baba. We got out and sat inside the fort. It was a grand Torino navy blue, Baba said. I drove it around the block, testing the brakes, the radio, the turn signals. I parked it in the lot of our apartment building and shut off the engine. Tashakur Baba John, I said. I wanted to say more, tell him how touched I was by his act of kindness, how much I appreciated all that he had done for me, all that he was still doing, but I knew I'd embarrass him. Tashakur, I repeated instead. He smiled and leaned back against the headrest, his forehead almost touching the ceiling. We didn't say anything, just sat in the dark, listened to the tink-tink of the engine cooling, the wail of a siren in the distance. Then Baba rolled his head toward me. I wish Hassan had been with us today, he said. A pair of steel hands closed around my windpipe at the sound of Hassan's name. I rolled down the window, waited for the steel hands to loosen their grip. I would enroll in junior college classes in the fall. I told Baba the day after graduation. He was drinking cold black tea and chewing cardamom seeds, his personal trusted antidote for hangover headaches. I think I'll major in English, I said, winced inside, waiting for his reply. English? Creative writing, he considered this, sipped his tea. Stories, you mean? You'll make up stories. I looked down at my feet. They pay for that, making up stories? If you're good, I said, and if you get discovered. How likely is that, getting discovered? It happens, I said. He nodded. And what will you do while you wait to get good and get discovered? How will you earn money? If you marry, how will you support your khanum? I couldn't lift my eyes to meet his. I'll find a job. Oh, he said. Bah, bah. So if I understand, you'll study several years to earn a degree. Then you'll get a chatty job like mine. One you could just as easily land today on a small chance that your degree might someday help you get discovered. He took a deep breath and sipped his tea, grunted something about medical school, law school, and real work. My cheeks burned and guilt coursed through me, the guilt of indulging myself at an expense of his ulcer, his black fingernails, and aching wrists. 
But I would stand my ground. I decided. I didn't want to sacrifice for Baba anymore. The last time I had done that, I had damned myself. Baba sighed and this time tossed a whole handful of cardamom seeds in his mouth. Sometimes I got behind the wheel of my Ford, rolled down the windows and drove for hours from the East Bay to South Bay, up the peninsula and back. I drove through the grids of cottonwood lined streets in our Vermont neighborhood where people who'd never shaken hands with kings lived in shabby, flat, one-story houses with barred windows, where old cars like mine dripped oil on blacktop driveways. Pencil-gray chain-link fences closed off the backyards in our neighborhood. Toys, bald tires, and beer bottles with peeling labels littered unkempt front lawns. I drove past tree-shaded parks that smelled like bark, past a strip malls big enough to hold five simultaneous Buzkashi tournaments. I drove to Torino up the hills of Los Altos, idling past estates with picture windows and silver lions guarding the Ruth Iron Gates, homes with cherub fountains lining the manicured walkway and no Ford Torinos in the driveways. Homes that made Baba's house in Wazir Akbar Khan look like a servant's hut. I'd get up early some Saturday mornings and drive south on Highway 17, push the fort up the winding road through the mountains of Santa Cruz. I would park by the old lighthouse and wait for sunrise, sit in my car and watch the fog rolling in from the sea. In Afghanistan, I had only seen the ocean at the cinema. Sitting in the dark next to Hassan, I had always wondered if it was true what I'd read, that sea air smelled like salt. I used to tell Hassan that someday we'd walk on a strip of seaweed-strewn beach, sink our feet in the sand and watch the water recede from our toes. The first time I saw the Pacific, I almost cried. It was as vast and blue as the oceans on the movie screens of my childhood. Sometimes in the early evening, I parked the car and walked up a freeway overpass, my face pressed against the fence. I tried to count the blinking red taillights inching along, stretching as far as my eyes could see, BMWs, Saabs, Porsches, cars I'd never seen in Kabul, where most people drove Russian Volgas, old Opels or Iranian Pecans. Almost two years had passed since we had arrived in the U.S., and I was still marveling at the size of this country, its vastness. Beyond every freeway lay another freeway, beyond every city another city, hills beyond mountains and mountains beyond hills, and beyond those more cities and more people. Long before the Rusi army marched into Afghanistan, long before villages were burned and schools destroyed, long before mines were planted like seeds of death, and children buried in rock-piled graves, Kabul had become a city of ghosts for me, a city of hair-lipped ghosts. America was different. America was a river roaring along, unmindful of the past. I could wade into this river, let my sins drown to the bottom, let that waters carry me somewhere far, let the waters carry me someplace far, someplace with no ghosts, no memories, no sins. If for nothing else... For that, I embraced America. The following summer, the summer of 1984, the summer I turned 21, Baba sold his wig and bought a dilapidated 71 Volkswagen bus for $550 from an old Afghan acquaintance who'd been a high school science teacher in Kabul. The neighbor's heads turned the afternoon the bus sputtered up the street and farted its way across our lot. Baba killed the engine and let the bus roll silently into our designated spot. We sank in our seats, laughed until tears rolled down our cheeks, and more important, until we were sure the neighbors weren't watching anymore. The bus was a sad carcass of rusted metal, shattered windows replaced with black garbage bags, balding tires and upholstery shredded down to the springs. But the old teacher had reassured Baba that the engine and transmission were sound, and on that account, the man hadn't lied. On Saturdays, Baba woke me up at dawn. As he dressed, I scanned the classified in the local papers and circled the garage sales ads. We mapped our route, Vermont, Union City, Newark, and Hayward first, then St. Jose, Melpitas, Sunnyvale, and Campbell if time permitted. 
Baba drove the bus, sipping hot tea from the thermos, and I navigated. We stopped at garage sales and bought knickknacks that people no longer wanted. We haggled over old sewing machines, one-eyed Barbie dolls, wooden tennis rackets, guitars with missing strings, and old Electrolux vacuum cleaners. By mid-afternoon, we'd filled the back of the VW bus with used goods. Then, early Sunday mornings, we drove to San Jose flea market of Berryessa, rented a spot, and sold the junk for a small profit. A Chicago record that we'd bought for a quarter the day before might go for $1 or $4 for a set of five. A ramshackle Singer sewing machine purchased for $10 might, after some bargaining, bring in $25. By that summer, Afghan families were working an entire section of the San Jose flea market. Afghan music played in the aisle of the used goods section. There was an unspoken code of behavior among Afghans at the flea market. You greeted the guy across the aisle. You invited him for a bite of potato bolani or a little kabuli, and you chatted. You offered tasalli condolences for the death of a parent, congratulated the birth of children, and shook your head mournfully when the conversation turned to Afghanistan and the Rusis, which it inevitably did. But you avoided the topic of Saturday because it might turn out that the fella across the aisle was the guy you'd nearly blindsided at the freeway exit yesterday in order to beat him to a promising garage sale. The only thing that flowed more than tea in those aisles was Afghan gossip. The flea market was where you sipped tea with almond kluchas cookies, and learned whose daughter had broken off an engagement and run off with her American boyfriend, who used to be Parchami, a communist in Kabul, and who had bought a house with under-the-table money while still on welfare. Tea, politics, and scandal, the ingredients of an Afghan Sunday on the flea market. I'd understand sometimes as Baba sauntered down the aisle, hands respectfully pressed to his chest, greeting people he knew from Kabul, mechanics and tailors selling hand-me-down wool coats and scrapped bicycle helmets, alongside former ambassadors, out-of-work surgeons, and university professors. One early Sunday morning in July 1984, while Baba set up, I bought two cups of coffee from the concession stand and returned to find Baba talking to an older, distinguished-looking man. I put the cups on the rear bumper of the bus, next to the Reagan Bush for 84 sticker. Amir, Baba said, motioning me over. This is General Saheb Mr. Iqbal Tahiri. He was a decorated general in Kabul. He worked for Ministry of Defense. Tahiri, why did that name sound familiar? The general laughed like a man used to attending formal parties where he'd laughed on cue at the minor jokes of important people. He had wispy silver gray hair combed back from his smooth tanned forehead and tufts of white in his bushy eyebrows. He smelled like cologne and wore an iron gray three-piece suit, shiny from too many pressings. The gold chain of a pocket watch dangled from his vest. Such a lofty introduction, he said, his voice deep and cultured. Salam, Bacham. Hello, my child. Salam, General Saheb, I said, shaking his hand. His thin hands belied a firm grip, as if a steel hid beneath the moisturized skin. Amir is going to be a great writer, Baba said. I did a double take at this. He has finished his four years of college and earned A's in all of his courses. Junior college, I corrected him. Mashallah, General Tahiri said. Will you be writing about our country? History, perhaps? Economics? I write fiction, I said, thinking of the dozen or so short stories I had written in the leather-bound notebook Rahim Khan had given me wondering why I was suddenly embarrassed by them in this man's presence. Ah, a storyteller, the general said. Well, people need the stories to divert them at difficult times like this. He put his hand on Baba's shoulder and turned to me. Speaking of stories, your father and I hunted pheasants together one summer day in Jalalabad, he said. It was a marvelous time. If I recall correctly, your father's eyes proved as keen in the hunt as it has in business. Baba kicked a wooden tennis racket on our tarpaulin spread with the toe of his boot. Some business. 
General Tahiri managed a simultaneously sad and polite smile, heaved a sigh and gently patted Baba's shoulder. Zendegi migzare, he said, life goes on. He turned his eyes to me. We Afghans are prone to a considerable degree of exaggeration, Bacham. And I have heard many men foolishly labeled great. But your father has the distinction of belonging to the minority who truly deserves the label. This little speech sounded to me the way his suit looked, often used and unnaturally shiny. You're flattering me, Baba said. I am not, the general, I am not, the general said, tilting his head sideways and pressing his hand to his chest to convey humility. Boys and girls must know the legacy of their fathers, he turned to me. Do you appreciate your father, Bacham? Do you really appreciate him? Bali, General Saheb, I do, I said, wishing he'd not call me my child. Then congratulations, you're already halfway to being a man. He said with no trace of humor, no irony, the compliment of the casually arrogant. Pedarjan, you forgot your tea, a young woman's voice. She was standing behind us, a slim-hipped beauty with velvety coal-black hair, an open thermos and a styrofoam cup in her hand. I blinked, my heart quickening. She had thick black eyebrows that touched in the middle like the arced wings of a flying bird and the gracefully hooked nose of a princess from old Persia, maybe that of Tahmine, Rostam's wife and Sohrab's mother from the Shahnameh. Her eyes, walnut brown and shaded by fanned lashes, met mine, held for a moment, flew away. You are so kind, my dear, General Saheb said. He took the cup from her. Before she turned to go, I saw she had a brown sickle-shaped birthmark on the smooth skin just above the left jawline. Before she turned to go, I saw she had a brown sickle-shaped birthmark on the smooth skin just above her left jawline. She walked to the dull gray van two aisles away and put the thermos inside. Her hair spilled on one side when she kneeled amid boxes of old records and paperbacks. My daughter, Soraya John, General Tahiri said. He took a deep breath like a man eager to change the subject and checked his gold pocket watch. Well, time to go and set up. He and Baba kissed on the cheek and he shook my hand with both of his. Best of luck with the writing, he said, looking me in the eye. His pale blue eyes revealed nothing of the thoughts behind them. For the rest of that day, I fought the urge to look toward the gray van. It came to me on our way home. Taheri, I knew I'd heard that name before. Wasn't there some story floating around about Taheri's daughter? I said to Baba, trying to sound casual. You know me, Baba said, inching the bus along the queue exiting the flea market. Talks turns to gossip and I walk away. But there was, wasn't there? I said. Why do you ask? He was looking at me coyly. I shrugged and fought back a smile. Just curious, Baba. Really? Is that all? He said, his eyes playful, lingering on mine. Has she made an impression on you? I rolled my eyes. Please, Baba. He smiled and swung the bus out of the flea market. We headed for Highway 680. We drove in silence for a while. All I've heard is that there was a man once and things didn't go well. He said this gravely like he disclosed to me that she had breast cancer. Oh, I hear she's a decent girl, hardworking and kind. But no Khastagar, no suitors have knocked on the general's door since, Baba sighed. It may be unfair, but what happens in a few days, sometimes even a single day, can change the course of a whole lifetime, Amir, he said. Laying awake in bed that night, I thought of Soraya Tahiri's sickle-shaped birthmark, her gently hooked nose, and the way her luminous eyes had fleetingly held mine. My heart stuttered at the thought of her. Soraya Tahiri, my swap meet princess. Sounds like we're going to have a love story too. But to be honest, I still wonder where Hassan is and what has happened to him during the war. Like and subscribe for the next part.